Marshan left circle. Feeds left to the net. Pasternak through its legs. Fired. They score. Did he get that? A magician like play out in front as he pulled that puck between its legs and flipped it by Hutchinson just inside the near post. A power play goal. It spins back. Now finding the open ice. So it's Mr. Stalini. Takes the shot. Rebound is there. They better go ahead. The Bruce says they score. Jack Eichel with wrist line and taking it to the net. And overtime is Sabres time. They stay perfect at home. And with that, we welcome you to another episode of Our Line Starts. Joined by Mike Milbury and Keith Jones, I'm Catherine Tappan. We have a lot to get to in the podcast. Your debut and my debut on the podcast, yeah, Mike. I hope it's my swan song, too. <laughs> we'll, we'll see after the end of this. Yeah, you might right. make it that way, depending on which way you go. With we got any more money for this, by the way? I'm going to let you negotiate that. All right. Former yeah, GM. get in there. And get get in there. Get Let's something going. Something I'll give it a whirl. It's exciting, though, right? I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> 12 years you and I have been together on television, Mike. It's very an honor to sit with you now on a podcast. Thank you, Catherine. Likewise. Did you ever get suspended <laughs> when you worked with Catherine before? Suspended. I did get suspended. You did? What? Wait, can we tell I that can, story? I, yeah. You, you tell your version, and then I'm going to tell my version. Well, I forget. You tell your version, and I'll tell mine. <laughs> no. Selective memory there. <laughs> yeah. I recall in a post-game show on Nesson for a Boston Bruins game, first segment, you were not happy with the producer for some regard, yes. some reason. I was very unhappy with him. You were very unhappy. We were at the TD Garden in Boston. And he was so, trying to get me to do things that I didn't want to do. Which is a big no-no. No, it's Mike definitely a, a no-no. And so uh, <laughs> I said, I'm leaving. And he said, what do you mean you're leaving? And Gord Kluzak was with me. And I said, Gord can finish it from here. And he said, why are you leaving? I said, because I can. <laughs> Mike, and I just a five-segment post-game show. We like, have four more segments oh, yeah. to go, and he tells the producer he's leaving. Yeah. Well, well, Threatened why, to leave. Why do you suspend it? Because well, done that he here, and you're still here. <laughs> so, but the best is he leaves, and he rips off his microphone, and he storms out of the... You know, the, the well, sweet. He was really being obnoxious, you know, trying me to do things that were really not fun for TV. And, and I just didn't <laughs> yeah, want to do You them. didn't hear from So, anyway, he walks off, and I've got the producer in my ear being like, Well, is he coming back? I said, No, 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 he's not coming back. Well, where did he go? I said, I don't know, but he's not coming back, and we need to readjust our post game segments going forward. I actually watched that. So, the that next one. day, really the next, so Mike's all of a sudden gone for segments four to, or two through five. So, the next day, I get a call from Mike, and it's a voicemail. Catherine? Mike Milbury. Yes. Call, I was told to call to apologize, so I'm calling to apologize. I'm suspended one game. I'll see you after that. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> it was a sincere, it heartfelt apology. It was very apology. sincere. Yeah. I wouldn't expect yeah. anything less. Yeah. So, it was good. Anyway. But anyway. Hopefully you don't walk up the set of the podcast. Yes, okay. live to see another day. All right, so here's what we have coming up ahead. The surging Sabres are at it again. Is this the year that Buffalo returns to the postseason, or could this be a repeat of last year's strong start? Hmm. Things are getting tense in Toronto with both Mike Babcock and Austin Matthews venting their frustrations. We're going to talk about what's wrong with the Leafs. Pierre Maguire sits down with one of the best men in hockey, Devils general manager Ray Shiro. And morning skates, are they a waste of time? Penn's coach Mike Sullivan seems to think so. I think the man to my left thinks so too. But we're going to dive into all of that. We're going to start with the Buffalo Sabres. And this has been a fun team to watch. This is a team that comes in. They've got a new head coach. You have every reason to believe in them. Jack Eichel was a star, is a star. You've got Jeff Skinner signed. But this coach to me, Mike, is what's so intriguing. He was a chairman of a Premier League team and comes here as a coach in the NHL, makes a seamless transition. Guys love playing for him. I mean, is he the biggest reason why they're doing so well? The, certainly, they're, they've got a young group of talented players that have come around Jack Eichel off to a, a tremendous start. But there's no doubt that uh, Kruger has made a difference from what I gather, and I, I'm not around the Buffalo team. I, I feel, first of all, I feel glad for them because Buffalo is one of the great hockey towns in, in the NHL. I mean, they've been so snake bitten over the years. So to, to have them get all jacked up about a, 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 a Buffalo Sabres team that looks like it could be legit is, is kind of fun to watch. But what he, he has brought, apparently, what all good coaches, I think, do is he treats his players with dignity and honesty. You can go to him and say, you know, whatever you feel as well as him coming to you. Apparently his meetings are short, sweet, which all players, as you know, Jonesy, nobody wants to go to the meeting room and sit there for an hour and a half and look at videotape. So he, he seems to have created a situation where he's got the players' ears um, and he's given them confidence. They're playing, by his account, 
a much faster game and a game where they are allowed to take risks and be creative. You know, he talked about pre-scouting being such a factor these days that teams need to be able to allow their players to do things that are unorthodox or unexpected. And, and that's what's happening in Buffalo. They're getting offense from all across the board and their two goaltenders have been and that was the question what a defense and goaltender could hold up. They've got I think nine on the roster right now not everybody healthy but their save percentage amongst the goaltenders is at 926 and that's good stuff. So everything's rolling right. The caution flag goes up and it comes from Ralph Kruger. He said this is too small a sample. Let's not get too excited here. Let's make sure we pay attention to the details and continue to execute. So good start for them. Good on him. Yeah, and I think the timing was right with some of the new additions as well. Marcus Johansson comes over from his stopover in Boston where he was very good in the playoffs. He's also very good with other European players, and there's a lot of European players in Buffalo, including Rasmus Ristolainen, who's got off to a very good start, uh, was talked often about being moved in the offseason and there's a lot of Sabre fans that weren't necessarily seeing what they wanted to see in him as far as progression. It uh, looks like he's turned a corner. That's that's a really talented player that has showed glimpses that he can be highly competitive as well. Doesn't mind playing the game physically. So I think that's a real positive. Rasmus Dahlin is now another year older and looks outstanding in the see early See how going. he does so, his adverbs now? He used to say physical. He used to play physical and that. He yeah. does it right. You hear every, every, everybody else around the league, I hear it from time to time. He plays physical. He doesn't play physical, he plays physical, physically. Yeah. Jones and takes for it, and he drove this <laughs> into me. That's a fact. What many he... don't know about Mike, he's a very good teacher, <laughs> yeah. and he is very, very, very smart. What? Like Mensa smart. What, when my mom was alive and used to watch the show, she thought he was a real bully, and she'd always tell me, Milbury, I don't know about that. Milbury. I'd say, no, he's a really good guy off camera. But off camera. Wait, the biggest, and people, <clears throat> you don't want this revealed, but the biggest, the biggest thing that everybody thinks is that you're the mean guy, and Jones, he's so nice. Nice, and he's so nice on TV and classy, and it's the opposite in real really? life. Really? Isn't this? You're, this you're is the, true. You're the biggest, That's news to me. Actually, this is jokes are on the set and just the busting guy. everybody's chops. And he Mike is the one that helps the old lady yeah. off the, across the he street. He called me a dink on the air one night. And a, <laughs> well, you well, were a big one. one. No, yeah. I didn't know you he, could say that. He doesn't that on remember you. anybody's name. He just calls everybody Larry. <laughs> it's Larry. Hey, Larry, get over <laughs> or here. Or Andrew. We have a lot of Andrews, so it's easy to call all Andrew. Right? Shout out to Guy. No one's gonna believe you guys anyway, no matter what you say. That's true. So they won't. That's the thing. So yeah. So we'll get back to the Sabers in a second. Do you like that image, Mike, of being the bad guy on TV? I don't really give a <laughs> flying fart, to be honest with you. I just don't. I, I, really, <laughs> well, I'm just, at my you, age, at my age, I, I think I want to be honest. I want to be fair. I want to be accurate when I can be. But I, I still think you have to call the game the way it's presented by the players. And that sometimes means criticism and sometimes, I mean, listen, remember for the longest time, I was all over Alex Ovechkin. Mm -hmm. And... And I think there was good reason there. He wasn't paying enough attention to the other end of the ice. As great as he was as a goaltender, as great as his, his effort was, um, there were things that needed to be brought into his game in order to, to attain what he wanted to attain, which is a Stanley Cup championship. And anybody that remembers the Caps' run to the finals remembers back before that when his, his coach... Not there anymore, but his coach went to Russia and told him, you're going to have to make some changes in your game. And, you know, he bought into that. And we can, see, I, in my mind's eye, I can see Alex Ovechkin blocking shots. I can see him on the back check. I can see him playing responsibly defensively, making good line changes, all the things that I, I think we were talking about. And I recognize that. Mm -hmm. And I could see it, and I, and I applaud him for it. I didn't know if he was going to get to it. But in fairness to... Me, as well as in fairness to him, I, my job is to present what I see in my opinion and through my experience. And if that ruffles a feather, listen. Well, you speak a lot of the times what a lot of people are thinking. I think a lot of people at home probably agree with you on many things. And you're also accountable. Like, you don't just say it and then turtle away and hide from everybody. I mean, I remember no. being on the set with you at Nesson. And Aaron Ward came up for our post-game show, and you had said something critical about the players, not him, but other players in that locker room. And he came up and said, I was the only one who was going to be able to come up here and do this because no one wants to talk to you and be on set with you, Mike. And you grabbed the piece of my paper with a big Sharpie marker, and you wrote down your phone number, and you slammed it on the table, and you said, here, put that up in the locker room. If anybody has a problem, they can call right. me. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's not like you're saying it, and you don't want anybody I, I, to call you out on it. I don't know lots of guys in the league. I, I only know what I see when they 
play a game, when they have a performance, and their performance dictates how I view it, my experience dictates a little bit how I see it, and he's... He's been he's on now, before. He, yeah, he's... What are you? I don't 50. know what you are. You're 50. <laughs> what 50. are you? <laughs> what are you? You are a little... Uh, I mean, he's maybe more measured, but, I mean, I've seen him... I've seen him carve some people since and and, and but, rightly done but i will say along with i think the way you feel you're i don't carve people that or players that i don't think can play better mm. see that where, where it's unfair is when you're asking someone that doesn't have the you know the physical attributes to be a better player uh, that's unfair so it's normally when you see a player that has so much more potential that's not reaching it that they become a target and when they do well what people don't understand is we're happy that that player is playing as well as he possibly can. It's not, hey, he's showing us that he's better than we, th we thought. He no, we think he's really good, and we want to see him play to his potential, and that's where I think fairness comes into it. But it's mm -hmm. unfair to go after a player that's not able to play better than he's playing right now, and that's I think we do a pretty good job of managing that. Most of the time, players reveal themselves in a negative light when there's not enough effort or there's not enough attention to detail, there's not enough commitment to, to let's, let's face it, it's easy to play defense, defend against an opponent. You have to work hard, you skate hard, you're physically and mentally committed, and, and you execute defensively. The tougher end of the ice is to score goals, where you have to be creative and mm -hmm. gifted and skilled, and I think most of the time when we find players lacking in performance, it's because they haven't paid enough attention. They haven't concentrated enough. They haven't worked hard enough. And then it reveals a side of them that isn't so pleasant. And really, it's not the same with coaches, right? They get criticized when their team can't defend, when they're giving up goals. But very, very rarely do you criticize a coach for not having a team that's producing offensively because coaches can only coach so much as right. far as the offensive side of the game goes. Right? Well, the, I mean, the only caveat I have that is that sometimes the, the defensive schemes become so overbearing that everybody focuses on defense. I mean, listen, New Jersey, when they won their championships, were very focused on defense. There was a lot of talk about them being boring, and sometimes they were, but they were able to transition their good defense into offense, and it took them to the title yeah. three times. Yep. Speaking of transitions, you mentioned Alice Ovechkin. Let's transition to talking about the Capitals because this has been another great team this season. It's been the Washington Capitals. They beat the Calgary Flames this week. Matthew Kachuk called them the best team they've played all season, and that group includes Colorado, the Vegas Golden Knights. I mean, these are really good teams that Matthew Kachuk and the Flames have played, and he's saying Washington's the best. Why do you think that is, Jonesy? Because they're meaner, and for a player like Matthew Kachuk, it's a difficult opponent when there's not a lot of guys that you can pick on. And when you play Washington, they're going to pick on you. A Hathaway, who played in Calgary last year, was a really good pickup by Brian McClellan. Radko Gudas is another player that plays the game physically and will challenge you when you go up against him. They have Ovechkin, who Mike talked about, who plays an all-around game now. And they have the toughest guy in the league that scores goals in Tom Wilson. I think Ryan Reeves would argue he's the toughest guy, but Wilson's a much more productive player. That part of Washington's game is what gets the attention of players like Matthew Kachuk, who has nobody on that team that he can bully because there's a lot of guys to answer to. So I think that's where Washington separates themselves from most of the teams in the league. The team toughness thing is definitely there. You go back to when they won their championship and it was their physicality was there. I mean, Oshie's not big, but there's pound for pound, he's mm -hmm. as tough as there is in the league. And Nick Backstrom isn't physical, but he's totally unafraid. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and we're, we're forgetting one major piece here. John Carlson is having an incredible oh gosh, start to the year. season. I mean, I've already Why does he Ovechkin. never get Norris I don't, I don't, I don't know. nominations? I don't understand. <clears throat> I think this one, this time this around, year, he's, he's due. Uh, and Ovechkin has already started to talk about him. And when Ovi speaks, everybody listens, right? Yeah. Is it premature, though? I mean, of course can we it start is. talking about it? Right and, of course it is, but that, the kind of start that he had can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. And once you get that early season traction when it comes to these awards, uh, if you can sustain it a little bit longer, you're going to continue to get that support.
But he's been great, though. He's been fun to watch. He has, on the power and, play. And, and he has to be this year because they're not as deep on the blue line with Niskanen moving over. Niskanen played some big minutes for Washington as well, another right-handed shooting defenseman. So Carlson's being asked, as he has been in the past, How old is he now? to do everything. Carlson? Carlson. Jake, how old is be, Carlson? He's got to be. our researcher over there. 30 now? Is he, he signed that huge deal as a... Thirty yeah, in 30 January. In January. So, so he's prime time yes. for defense. And this is, yeah. you know, he's, defense usually takes a little bit longer to, because you have to read and react. The, the guys that are gifted and skilled go on that, the gift and skill to play offensively. But when you're in defense, you've got to learn to read plays, react to plays, find different situations. He now feels comfortable in that, and he can he can start to step out offensively. And, so he's, he's done it. And look how old Giordano was last year yeah. when he won the Norris Trophy. So I, I do think Mike's really onto something there. Age and experience matters, and being comfortable and being the guy mm -hmm. matters. And it looks like Carlson's ready to do all those things. And I, he'll be in the conversation at the end of the season, no doubt. Well, as good as Washington has been, uh, the same is not true in Toronto. Frustration beginning to mount. We've heard it from both head coach Mike Babcock as well as their young superstar, Austin Matthews. Slashing, tripping, hooking, tripping, tripping. So after a while, it's nobody else. It's own it and get on with it. Uh, I think it's just not good enough. Uh, you know, we need to be better. Uh, and I think it comes from a leadership group. I need to be better. Uh, all of us need to be better. I think we just need to look each other in the eye and uh, hold each other accountable. And, uh, you know, put this game aside and obviously uh, take a couple steps forward uh, and just be better for one another. They're not terrible, the Leafs. I'm sure Toronto Maple Leafs fans would disagree with me there. They're not the worst in the league. I mean, they're, they're right in the middle of the thick of things, the Atlantic. But what, what exactly concerns you most when you hear those two sound bites, Mike? It, it concerns me that, you know, Babcock's under pressure, that he's finished the last season under pressure. Um, will this be his last crack at it? And they clearly have invested as much money as they can possibly invest in their team. And yet he's talking about something as simple as discipline. I'm wondering, just saw that for the first time, by the way, I'm wondering if this is the kind of way you approach a young team like Toronto. Do they really need to hear about it from the podium as opposed to what we talked about earlier about Kruger, a soft conversation quickly in the locker room? That, that would be of concern to me that this early in the season, He's taken his complaints about his team to the podium. He's I mean, done that before, though, with has. this Leafs team last I has, season. And I'm telling you that. Did the, it work the, then, though? It 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 is a it has been an evolving thing with players and coaches and their relationship. You know, when I coached, it was, you know, and played. Let alone when I played, when I wanted to see the coach. I mean, I wanted to see Jerry Chivas once, and I asked him about a situation. He said, "Do the right thing." What the hell does that mean? Didn't have you know, the answer. Didn't have the answer. <laughs> I, I didn't know what. The, but it was like, here it is. You got to. You just play well. Don Cherry's system was, dump it up the boards and let the wingers get it out. It was simple. I mean, it, but, but, you were told what to do. You really didn't have a chance to, bite back. Now, it's different. That's the millennials out there. They're like, they're a pain in the ass. You know, you got to make sure you. You pat him on the back and give him a kiss on the cheek, and if you yell at him, you better be a soft whimper. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's the old guy in me, but that's just the way it is. You ha and I'm wondering if this is a sign that he's got to change or he's going to move on. Well, I, I just think there's a lot of pressure on a team that hasn't done anything yet, and those high expectations matter. Ralph Kruger's not going to get the same questions in Buffalo if the Sabres are off to a similar start to the Leafs this year because there was no expectations on what the Sabres will do. And for Babcock, the expectations are the Leafs are ready to take the next step and they've signed all the players. They're all, they've are all they all been paid handsomely for what they've yeah, done. Yeah, young but, players making a gazillion dollars. Right, and it? the fans believe that the, here it comes. They watch the Raptors win a championship yep. in the NBA and they think it's time for the Leafs to do the same. And they, they have had certain levels of progression over the last little while, but it's not there yet, and they're having some issues right now. So the questions are tough for Babcock after every game. And market, I think, dictates that. Uh, they're under the spotlight there. So I think he has to come up with 
creative ways on a nightly basis to answer similar questions. And I think sometimes it comes off maybe not exactly the way that he may have wanted to come off. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% I mean, sure. I maybe you should just adopt the Belichick method, right? Yeah. Just say absolutely nothing. But because would you I'm that? wondering, well, you don't want, it's not much fun, but he, he you know, if he can do what Belichick does and win every year, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that when I see that clip, and I'm gonna, I put myself in one of their leaf sweaters, I'm not real happy about that this early in the season. And, I played back-to-back -back against Boston. They beat Boston in overtime. They lost mm -hmm. to Boston in a, a close game. I mean, it's not like the wheels are off the wagon yet, but if they're taking stupid penalties, that should be easy enough to address. Um, sometimes less easy to change because you need you got younger players and you, and you have to factor in, are they in shape? Are they making these decisions rashly? Are they getting on the wrong side of the puck too often? You got to look at all that stuff. But going to the podium and saying it's on you, and by him saying on you, I meant it was on the players. Yeah. When you coached, Austin Matthews brought up being part of the leadership group that he put himself in that core leadership group. Did you have leadership groups, or did you have a captain and two alternate captains? I mean, is this this is I. They started doing it near the end of my career, and they started having six or seven players that were part of this leadership group, and they would have certain meetings with the coaches and then pass on that meeting. But it seemed before that it was limited to just, you know, the captain no, was the most guys. important and then the two alternates. They were always on the better teams that I played on, and I, and I was fortunate to play on some, there was always conversation. And a lot of times it was in a bar someplace after practice or on the road or... I don't think they or, do that anymore. No, no, I don't know if they do that yeah. anymore. I mean, they have guys are much more conscious of their nutritional needs than we were, but and anyway... And under the microscope. And under the microscope, too. But, so, yeah. but the conversations still have to take place, whether it's with... I don't think it can be just the leadership group, and it does sound like Ralph Kruger has taken all these guys together or separately and convinced them that they are better players than they were last year, and they're buying it. And I think it takes, not everybody's a leader, right? No. Uh, but there, there are guys that it will stand up, and I don't think they have to wear a letter. And, uh, you know, the Leafs don't have a lot of those guys, do they? They're very young. Uh, yeah, and, and their captain captain's hurt. hurt. Right yeah, now. But Tavares being hurt doesn't help either. Not a very vocal guy either, from what I understand. But, but still, and so th therefore the coach does have to step up. I just... I'll just say it one last time. I don't know that that's the way to do it. Not, not today. Well, we'll see. To be determined, right? We've got much more to get to. Penguins head coach Mike Sullivan offered up an interesting analogy regarding morning skates. We're going to talk about that. But Are we first... done yet? Am I done? Is no, you're not done. Over? We're going to keep you around. We have storytelling. Wow. You've got a big interview to listen to here. <laughs> stay that's tuned. right. Pierre Maguire is joined by New Jersey Devils general manager Ray Shiro. With Ray Shiro, the general manager of the New Jersey Devils, what's different between New Jersey and Pittsburgh? Uh, different state, that's for sure. Uh, no, it's it's great. I, in Pittsburgh, I was there eight years, and uh, my kids, uh, my two boys, actually kind of grew up there because they were in second and fourth grade, so we were there eight years. So, uh, but once we got here, they were in and almost out of high school, so they actually went to prep school uh, in New Hampshire. So, uh, it's a little bit different just from a family standpoint, um, but. Um, my older boy uh, is working for the Devils now. He graduated from Boston College last year and um, did some part-time scouting. Uh, was part of the hockey team there for a while. And um, so, and my other boy's in uh, uh, Connecticut College and having a great time as a sophomore. So uh, it's been fun. You were a big part of building that team. You went to back-to-back -back Stanley Cup Finals in 08 08 and 09. You win in 09, amazing moment for you. But this is a different process here in New Jersey. There you had Sidney Crosby, you had Evgeny Malkin. Here it's different. How do you quantify that as a manager? Um, I, I think actually, it, it, when I came here, it, it really was more of a rebuild, and that was exciting. Uh, Lou, I, worked, I was very fortunate to work with Lou Lamarillo for two and a half months. As a, I went to St. Lawrence and played hockey there and played against Lou when he coached at Providence. So, uh, but I, obviously, like everybody else, a great deal of respect for Lou. But to have the opportunity to work with him for two and a half months was something that you know was incredible experience for me and um, and he was when we you know we were with Josh Harris and David Blitzer the managing partners it was very that was, that was a big reason I came the three of them and they were very upfront and honest as where the, where it was and I, I think I really kind of looked at it as I was fortunate 14 years as an assistant GM uh, two expansion teams in Ottawa for five years and Nashville for eight years and I looked at that and I was really excited about it because. 
um, you know, having the support of, of Josh and David, and, and certainly like Craig Leopold in Nashville, and uh, when I worked with David Poyle uh, there, and that's what I, that was the challenge to kind of build it. It wasn't expansion, but it was kind of building something, which was great, and uh, the ability to, you know, we added to the scouting staff and the coaching staffs and development staff and pro scouting, amateur scouting. So, you know, and you know, you have a plan and everybody has one, but you know, when you have some tougher times, if um, you don't have that support and, you know, through tough times sometimes uh, people kind of change direction. But Josh and David have been fantastic. Um, they're having success with the 76ers, uh, sticking to a plan and doing it here. And uh, so I'm very fortunate for that. Speaking of plans, your father had a plan. The great Freddie Shiro, the Hockey Hall of Famer, Stanley Cup winning coach, and one of the more memorable fights early in Gordy Howe's career, your dad fought Gordy Howe uh, at Madison Square Garden. That's another story for mm -hmm. another day. But, you know, one of the things is I think you learned a lot from your father. Can mm -hmm. you tell the listeners and the viewers what you learned from your dad in terms of building a team? Not the cook, that's for sure. <laughs> um, he, that was my mom. Um, but, no, I think it was one of those things. My brother and I were totally different. My brother's two years older. He went to BU, uh, didn't play hockey or anything. And uh, I just had a passion when I was young to go to the rink every day with my dad. And I'm very fortunate that he never, ever pushed me or my mom never pushed me and my brother to be a hockey player uh, just get an education that was the first thing and um, I, I just you know my dad availed me to that he would just you know let me hop in the car when I was you know six years old and go to practice and or what I'm I always wanted to be around the rink and I think more of the passion I got from him and um, you know it's what I did see how he delegated even as a coach I've never coached um, but he was the first coach to ever have an assistant coach in the NHL 1972 Mike Nicoluk and then you know a few years later he it's uh, him and Mike Nicoluk and uh, Terry Crisp, Pat mm -hmm. Quinn, and the goalie coach was Jacques Plant. And I saw how you delegate responsibilities, and I think as a manager, that's exactly what you're doing. You're managing people, and whether you're in any business, and, and I learned a lot from that. Um, but again, it was one of those things, with more of the passion that if, you know, he didn't really, if he pushed me too hard at hockey, you know, I played, in, I played at St. Lawrence University, was drafted by LA, and never played in the NHL, but that was never his, or my mom, they just wanted me to be happy, and um, he wanted me to go to law school, but I never got that far, but um, got a great education at St. Lawrence, and, but it was more about the passion and, you know, making your own choices, which I, I think was um, really about what I, I've learned and um, from my mom and my dad, and, uh, you know, with him it was great, just um, about the managing of people, and I saw that, how he put a, a, a staff together and uh, didn't have success. So you, when you're a young man, you, your father wins the Stanley Cup twice in Philly. Can you talk about the first time you saw the Stanley Cup and you touched it? Uh, probably when I was 12. Um, actually, they went three times. They won twice, but they lost to Montreal in the third well, time. They didn't win oh, three. They only won that. two. They could have, but uh, that's another story. Uh, no, it's probably actually it's funny. I, I still have that picture. I was 12 years old. It's the parade, the first parade in Philadelphia. And I was 12, and a picture of my mom, my dad, my brother, and myself around the Stanley Cup. That's the remember the first time I've ever touched it and I still remember I had some god awful green short sleeve shirt on and tan pants for some reason and I, but I'll never forget that and I was 12 years old so um, but then you know to you know nine when we won and I, I you know that's an incredible moment as you know and mm -hmm. done that and it's one of those things that what was really incredible the next uh, year when you know my the names are finally on there and or I think it was at our cup party in the, the summer that summer my two boys could t see my name and then they wanted to see where Grampy's name was because they never, my father passed away in 1990, so before my, the boys were born. So I thought that was one of the most incredible things that, uh, see how excited they were? Like they were, thought they were excited to see my name, but they really wanted to see Grampy's too. So that was really great. And, um, but it was an incredible experience, uh, seven years there uh, with the Flyers for my dad. And um, I was, you know, I think I was nine to 16 years old or so. And so I remember so much about that every, so it's a special time in my life and always will be uh, the Flyers. You started as an agent. After you were released by the Los Angeles Kings, you became an agent. And you put mm -hmm. together a really successful mm -hmm. agency, and then you decided to go to the other side. What mm -hmm. made you do that? Um, I think I always wanted to, to be on that side. I think the agent thing for me is more getting in, I guess. I, you know, when I got out of St. Lawrence and um, after uh, LA's camp, it was, okay, what are you going to do? And I ended up moving to Boston. I was living in New York, but I moved to Boston. Uh, like a lot of my other buddies actually would try to, wanted to work on Wall Street and interviewed with a number of places there and actually had a job offer and then visited a good buddy of mine then in Boston on the weekend and I never really spent much time there and that was 1986, May of 86 and ended up having a great weekend, a great time and 
uh, with, you know, uh, one of my best buddies that I went to prep school with in St. Lawrence with and ended up moving to Boston. And uh, that was the agent business that kind of got started there in 86, 87 and uh, until about 93. And then Randy Sexton, uh, the assistant GM in Buffalo, now my captain at St. Lawrence and one of my best friends that he gave me the opportunity to be assistant GM in Ottawa in 93. And that to me was my passion and that's like the thing with anything in the, in the game here is the passion that you have and you, I know you have it and anything you do is to be passionate about it and that was kind of what I wanted to do and I had, you know, I, I look back and I've been in a GM for, I don't know, 12, 13 years, but I was assistant GM for 14 years and not one day did I work as an assistant GM to try to be a GM, I never did. And I just would love being in the game and, you know, working for Randy Sexton or Pierre Gauthier in Ottawa or David Poel for eight years or I just wanted to do the best job I could for them because I, I really loved doing it and um, I was very lucky to, they exposed me to a lot of different things and about the game and the agent business was really great for me in terms of building relationships with the client, but also learning the CBA and how those things work and um, it's, been, it's been fun and I think it's about the passion and about the game that I, I like being part of. You talked about David Poyle being one of your mentors and he's the winningest general manager of all time past Glenn Sather. Um, what did David teach you about the importance of patience and the importance of team building? Um, David, he, he was, he still is, he's a great sounding board for me and um, uh, working eight, like, I don't know, I, I knew David a bit, but I was assistant GM. He was a GM at the time for 15 years in Washington and in 98 started the team, uh, Craig Leopold, Jack Diller in, in Nashville. And I don't know how he got my name, I have no idea. And uh, you don't really, as assistant GM, at least back then, um, you're not exactly calling GMs. I mean, I would almost run the other way and I saw him, I was so intimidated. And um, and then he gave me that opportunity. And with David, and I learned a lot from him, he he, he empowers people to make decisions. And, um, you know, it was myself, Paul Fenton, Craig Channel, really, uh, assistant GM. And Paul was director of pro, uh, uh, player personnel and Craig was chief scout. But he would, you know, ask everything. He'd include, uh, what would you do if, in this situation? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? That he'd ask four more people. and. And it told me a lot about, well, you might only have, you know, really rely on three, but, you know, to know the, the four through seven guys, empowering them, and, you know, it's, um, and again, at the end, you have to make the final decision, but he really asked those questions, and, you know, what do you think about him? We can get this guy from the Islanders. Oh, yeah, he's good. Well, where's he going to play? He's a left wing. Yeah, but who are we going to take out? Oh, okay. Um, he's, he was always thinking ahead. He was always planning, and um, and that's what, you know, and he was very decisive and, you know, you see a lot of the big trades he's made over the last number of years in Nashville, but, you know, to build something like that, he had patience and I remember people say, ah, he doesn't like to make any deals, just, well, he had a plan and now you see him and, he, you know, obviously made some of the bigger deals uh, lately and, uh, and to see actually what's so great about Nashville and, and I almost look at it with New Jersey too, it's not a, to me, New Jersey and um, I grew up around this area, South Jersey, North uh, in, in Westchester, New York as well. It's not a traditional hockey market. It isn't. There's so much to do here, and but you learn a lot from being in Nashville for eight years, and you know, and they did an incredible job. And a few years ago, being the Stanley Cup Finals and, and the sea in Nashville the way it is now, and I remember we were there, and I said to David, "Why can't we play on? Why can't we play on Friday nights? Right? It's high school football. What? <laughs> I'm with the NHL. Yeah, but not as big <laughs> as high school football, and um, it's gone a long way in Nashville. And uh, David's, you know, every step of the way, it's been great, and." Um, I'm very fortunate that he picked me and I'm very fortunate that you know, I have someone like that in my life and um, it's a great thing. You talked about the importance of making deals and how David wasn't shy of making deals. I look at some of your body of work going back to Pittsburgh. You weren't afraid to trade Jordan Stahl. I don't think you wanted to trade him, but you weren't afraid to trade him. You come to New Jersey, you get Kyle Palmer, you get Sammy Botten and you make a huge deal to get Taylor Hall. And then you make the huge deal last summer to bring in P.K. Subban. So you've not been a shrinking violet when it comes to making deals. Take us through what it, the process is to make a gigantic mm -hmm. deal when you're the general manager. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, that is the biggest thing, Pierre, the difference of uh, the AGM. Like you can, it's the best job in hockey, trust me. And every team seems to have two now. And you can make the recommendations, and at the end, it's not really you. Um, if it doesn't work, we know where the blame goes. And, but you, you know, you would need that. You need the, the recommendations. And I think it's uh, also from learning along the years, especially from David, communicating with your staff and your pro staff and your coaches and being, okay, you're, they have to know what the needs are so they know what you're looking for. And um, But I think the first big deal I ever did was uh, the Marion Hosa thing. And 
uh, my second year in Pittsburgh and with Don Waddell and um, I was shaking like a leaf and you know a few years later when I worked with Donnie and I worked together when I was in Pittsburgh for a few years and Donnie's like you were shaking and he had done the job for a long time and he's like I was running out of time I, I mean <laughs> I thought I had another deal and it didn't and you and and it's funny from and I think a lot of it is and I learned a lot of this from Randy Sexton and Pierre Gauthier too is that play be the GM for the other team what are they looking for and sometimes you know the recommendations you get from either pro scouts or your assistant GM, whatever okay why would they do that well I don't know but he'd be good yeah, I know but why would they do that and um, I go okay here's the deal let's let's say it's Anaheim um, here's Bob Murray's number why don't you give him a call and see what he, if he'll do that uh, okay get it like and you know that's really it really starts and I think you know I, uh, maybe it's Anaheim too with Bob Murray I've, you know over the years we've done a number of deals and we trust each other it doesn't get out beforehand and you know the last one was Vatnin and Adam and Reek and that was a tough one Adam was a you know, very popular mm -hmm. player here and um, scored the goal against the Rangers in, in overtime in game six a few years ago and but there was a need for them need for us and what really that was a really good trade just because for both because I don't think Anaheim makes the playoffs without Adam and Henrique and we don't make the playoffs a couple years ago without mm -hmm. Sammy and that to me is the best thing and you know you don't like the I don't obviously don't like it you always say if you trade somebody and I always say to the guy hey good luck and I hope you do great and I always say well I hope you don't make the Hall of Fame obviously but um, you don't want to win or lose that because uh, you, you want it to be good for everybody and um, but you know some of those deals take time and some of them happen right away and we mentioned the PK one and that was the with David and I haven't done it maybe maybe one deal with David I've done, done really many at all and that just happened over the course of a, you know a few days really at the draft and and uh, I remember Friday night after the first round and he told me to come up to their suite there at the rink and it was Brian Poyle his son who I know very well and Jeff Kelty and mm -hmm. um, and uh, and Peter Laviolette and and me so I'm like this isn't fair I mean <laughs> I need reinforcements or what <laughs> and David just said Ray you know me we're trying to decide what to do like, we've got another deal and we got your deal and they were t you know they were both different and I said David I don't know the other deal I don't care and um, you told me what you're looking for and you needed to c clear cap space and um, I can't tell you other deals so I don't care I just told them I said those I've learned from you you this what this provides you is cap space and certainty moving into July 1 that's all I can tell you and I learned that from you so you guys decide I'm not gonna sit here and talk to you guys unless you want to offer me a beer or something but to let me know tomorrow I guess I mean I can't tell you what to do but um, if you could do me a favor though if you do the other deal just let me know beforehand so I can obviously let you know Josh Harris and David Blitzer know that we're out and then he called me the next day at breakfast and I was actually with Josh Harris having a uh, coffee one of your owners yeah it's yeah. Josh and uh, and it was David I'm like and Josh was like uh I'm like well it's good news or bad news I guess <laughs> so and he said do you still want to do it I'm like yeah you're expecting always the opposite and I go yeah and I'm looking at Josh I'm like I think you might oh, yeah I go hold on a second so I said they're gonna they want to do the deal they, Josh said yeah absolutely so I said David we're in we're, we're good and we went through the terms like we talked about from the you know and um, so I'll meet you at he goes I'll meet you at the uh, I'll meet you at the rink before the start of the second round and and he goes I'll meet you at our usual spot because it, during the first round I was meeting him behind their table by the coke machine by the media thing but it had to be around the corner someone saw us I'm like that place yeah that place so that's where I met him and, <laughs> and actually it was funny it, I, we didn't know it because we were talking it was right before the start of the second round and your buddy Bob McKenzie was smart enough to be hanging around like the Trade Center like room or something um, Central Registry and Bob took a picture of us talking and that's the picture and with um, David's uh, granddaughter in the picture you know, she was one of the little runners for Nashville okay. and um, and he he goes and he walked up to us and said and you know he's such a pro Bob he said listen I got an idea what's going on here but I won't go I looked at David I'm like I'm not David's like yeah that's that's yeah that's, that's the deal and we were just walking and, and so sure enough he goes here's a picture I just took so you know you can have it so I have that picture with David and that's really probably the only the big deal I've done with him but really not many so it was great I remember when your father passed away uh, back in the late 80s early 90s obviously 1990 um, he got in the Hall of Fame 2000 I think it was and you gave an amazing speech mm -hmm. 
Can you talk about the emotion of that moment for you and your family? Yeah, that was, uh, that was, yeah, that was, uh, I don't know. It was, uh, um, what was really incredible is that Ed Snyder, um, had passed away a few years after, but, um, Ed was the original owner and from the Flyers from day one and he and Keith Allen hired my dad in 1971 and they won two cups and, um, but Kelly Mass from the Hall of Fame, the, mm -hmm. the Flyers at Snyder that started a plane and for all the alumni and players and they said that's the first time they saw that the whole, you know, all those guys were there and Ed and that was, thank God that, you know, Bobby Clark, of course, who actually, um, when my father passed away, he, uh, gave the eulogy at my father's funeral. Um, you know, Bernie Prant, who uh, just incredible, I've, all these guys I grew up with when I was nine to, you know, 16 years old and actually Bill Barber's son I just saw yesterday and the, they all went there and it was when you prepare for something like that and you're so nervous to begin with and you're trying to encapsulate your what your father meant to the game of hockey but also your family and you as a kid and the impact and um, you know the Soviet impact that it had on my dad and um, and I mentioned a lot of that and it's funny that you know obviously uh, Trey Jack uh, uh, was there and you know when I brought up um, you know so the Russian influence and I've met him a few other times, uh, uh, Mr. Trejak, and it was just a whole, you know, uh, from when he was born in Winnipeg throughout, but, you know, is, you know, my, f my brother's name, Jean Paul, he's named after Jean Paul Denis, one of my dad's captains back in the uh, Central Hockey League and maybe St. Paul or something, but everybody along the way had an impact on my mom and my dad, and I, I think they did as well on that to me. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's about the people, it's about the passion for the game and the impact you, you leave, and, you know, um, I was in Pittsburgh for eight years, and you know, hopefully a, a legacy you leave there mm -hmm. is, you know, about those the players that are there, or trainers, or because uh, you know everybody has an impact, and that's what you try to do. Who came up with this line? Was it your father's line? Win today, and we walk together forever. Was yep. that your father's yep. line? Yeah, it was. Did you yep. ever hear that before he said it to his team? No, no, and uh, that's been used many times since. But that was May 19, 1974, for Game Six against the Bruins afternoon, and they won the Cup, first expansion team, and. Um, that was the first time. I don't worry. I had no idea. Um, but it's funny. But he was a well-read man. Your oh father. yeah, yeah. People for sure. don't know that. Oh, yeah, about no. Your oh, absolutely. He actually was going to go to law school and all that stuff. And he was. Uh, it was I said it in the Hall of Fame speech. Actually, he. Um, I read, actually, I think maybe Stan Fisher told me that. But um, he was the first New York Ranger. He played for the Rangers for three years as a defenseman. But he was the first New York Ranger, to, and he was proud of it to ever hold the New York Public Library card. I swear. Mm -hmm. So he, yeah. we, he had books all the time. Um, you know, he, he, he loved uh, history, loved uh, uh, the, everything about um, uh, history, about people, about uh, improving himself, and, um, but finding out about things. And, um, you know, it was, you know, that whole thing, uh, you know, um, it, it's, and I just said this about a month or two ago to my boys. Uh, it was in this, uh, when the Baltimore Ravens won the Super Bowl, Arbaugh said, said that before the, the you know, Super Bowl Sunday, when today we'll walk together forever. He goes, that's what I told the team. And he's like maybe the only person I've ever seen as ever. And he said, you know who, that's, that was Fred Shearer, the coach of the Flyers that said that. And they won the Stanley Cup. And I was like, holy cow. And I showed it to my boys just about a month ago. They're like, wow, that's cool. And um, I have no idea where he came up with that. And, um, but he had some incredible sayings. And, you know, it's funny to see some of his former players. And, um, you know, so, but that was probably his most famous one for sure. Most NHL fans wouldn't know that he actually coached over in Europe. He coached in Holland, in Tilburg. In Tilburg. Mm -hmm. Where did you play? You played in? Halein. Yep. So that was, yeah, it was probably, where, in 87 or so? And he, so it was about three, four years before he yeah. passed away, but it was, um, my mom really enjoyed it for the year and uh, living somewhere different and she's from Shawinigan and but they had an incredible time. And actually, I think uh, one of the predecessors there was Lou Vero, his good friend mm -hmm. Lou Vero. Uh, incredible guy, and um, no, I think it was a great, great life experience. And uh, as you know, you played there, but I've never been to Holland, but I want to go because he told some good stories, but you told better ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's so that's good. funny. Long term prognostication on the Devils where are they headed? Um, I think I think their best days are obviously ahead of us, and I think back what we two years ago. Um, you know, our first year we were here, 14, 15, I think we overachieved, and but we had a plan going in in terms of uh, accumulating assets, and it would take some time. And the second year was 16, 17. I wasn't happy at all. I don't. I wasn't very proud of the team I put together, and um, you know, certainly in 17, 18, you know, some of our draft picks started to kind of come in, and you know, I think it was Heischer's first year, Jesper Bratt, um, Will Butcher signed with us a free agent, which was huge, 
And then, you know, it was the second year for Taylor Hall, which you saw, you know, so it was really, really, if that has, if the playoffs and MB, MVP season happened for him his first year here, it was uh, great, but it wouldn't have been as satisfying mm -hmm. to see the growth of him and what he went through, both on and off the ice, to become the, the, the player, the leader. And, and I'm proud of the fact that, you know, Sidney Crosby, Malkin, if, okay, they won three cups, but I was a GM, they won the first. Chris, they're, they're Hall of Fame players. I'm, uh, I was very, very proud of the fact that we could do it. You know, Taylor, it was the first time he made the playoffs, and um, he's a great kid. And um, But I think that really, I, even last year, when obviously our I seemed to go, I, it's, it wasn't like that my second year, because there's so much about the foundation that's here, about the younger players, about a culture, about accountability that we have. And it's take, it takes time to do it. And and I said this, I say this all the time, and you know everybody talks about having a culture. and. I don't even know what that means. I really don't. I, I guess so you look up in the dictionary, and but culture is when you have it, you know it, and when you don't, you feel it, and that's all. And we do have it, and that's why going through this, we have good people that care, um, and they've had success, you know, two years ago. But there are standards here, and I think um, you know you have to trust that. And at the same time, it's you know it's a, we had a very good training camp, and you know had incredible three days at Naval Academy, and. Um, you know, it's, you know, but we have to, you know, believe in that and, and, and find a way out. And, you know, if this was in January or something like that, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But to start the year like we have, we certainly have to, you know, play, play as we're capable, which we have in the three of the six games. We, we, but you know what? They don't give you points for trying. So um, we got to find a way. Ray Shiro, thanks so much for right, the awesome Pierre. visit. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Great insight there from Ray Shiro. Uh, I love listening to him talk so much. Uh, he has such a great hockey mind, one of the, the, the nicer people in hockey. Uh, he's always very kind with his time, very generous. So um, we thank him for giving time to Pierre as well. But, you know, you look at this Devils team, and I hear about it all the time, being a New Jersey girl. And I was on the driving range just two weekends ago, and people were coming up to me asking about the Devils after the first game they lost. <laughs> I said, gets a long season. But, Mike, you did the game. You know, you, you did the Rangers-Devils game when they got their first win. Uh, what do you see from this team? Are they a playoff team? They have work to do. Um, they, they hadn't scored until that game. They had not scored a power play goal through the first six. Their penalty killing was equally atrocious. Nothing seemed to be going right. Their number one pick seemed to have a deer in the headlights look for a while. But they found a, a way to win. It was not a pretty win. It was a, an ugly win, but they beat the Rangers. And then and they... they won another one in the U battle of use versus use and it was and it was Jack getting his first goal so I thought I thought their coach uh, when he was being grilled the morning of that New York Ranger game handled it very well like he there was no there was no panic there was no didn't seem to be worried about anything I mean mm -hmm. he just said listen we we think we could have earned a couple of wins we made a couple of mistakes uh, but now we just got to go out and find a way to win, and, and, and they did. And I, I think they can regroup. I think they have some pretty good balance. I think they still have some holes on the blue line. But I, I, I um, if you're asking me if they're a playoff team, I say unlikely. But it, it's they're better than what they showed in the first six. That's for sure. What do you think of the way John Hines handled Tom Fitzgerald coming onto the bench? My understanding is that he asked him to do it, and I. I you know, I assume that that's true. He said it. Uh, they go back a long way. They have a history together. And anybody that knows Tom Fitzgerald knows that, uh, you know, he's one of the nice guys in the game, one of the hardest working guys that that played the game in his era. Uh, I think universally respected. And uh, I don't think there was any ego involved, and I think that's a good, another good sign for Heinz. Yeah, they had done that before and, uh, in the Penguins organization under Ray Shiro as well, right? They made that swap and brought somebody down to the bench to help out. But, um, I mean, we'll see what happens with the Devils here. But you have to wonder. And goaltending is, seems to be a little bit shaky as well with the injuries for Corey Schneider. And Mackenzie Blackwood's done okay, but... I don't know how to... Ex I thought Corey Schneider was coming into his own as one of the league yeah. goaltenders injuries. in the league. And then I guess it just... Injuries, the injuries yeah. caught up to him, and it's been a, it's been a struggle, but... I mean, you know, if you're not going anywhere unless you're getting good goaltending.
and uh, they they need to make sure well, that takes place. And Blackwood had two really good games in a mm -hmm. row, right? The second one was a shutout against Vancouver, that one nothing win. So, and that was a good hockey game. That was a better game than the Ranger game, which I didn't think either team played very well. Yeah. But the Vancouver Devils game, the the one nothing game, was an entertaining yeah. game, and Blackwood was great in that. So, you never know. You never know. What we do know is that Penguins head coach Mike Sullivan, he was asked this week about the importance of the morning skate in the NHL, and he had this to, th to say. Well, you know, part of me, as I said, we're trying to manage workloads. I've always been a believer that it's the most overrated practice in hockey. Yeah. You know, it's like, why, why do we, why does the whole league have morning skates? You know, it reminds me of why my mother cut the side of the hams off <laughs> before she cooked them. And I asked her, why do you cut the side of the hams off? She said, I don't know, because that's how my mother taught me. I asked, <laughs> so I asked my grandmother. Yeah. I said, why do you cut the sides of the hams off before you put them in the oven? She said, well, that was easy. I didn't have a pan that was big enough. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's... So that's my analogy of morning skates. <laughs> It's a pretty good analogy. It, it I think is. a lot of us would probably agree. We wonder what the heck is the point of the morning um, skate, Mike? It, it's... Like everything else in the game, it's had an evolution. It started when uh, guys would come in and try out their sticks in their street clothes. Um, Jonesy likes to think it was because the the coaches wanted to make sure they got the guys out of bed because they were out drinking the night before. It was 90% of it. You guys <laughs> didn't mind but, going but, up the That was the, night the Jonesy before. plan for the morning <laughs> yeah. skate. Oh, it's but it era. was test your skates, <laughs> test your t test your things out, and then and then leave. It was and some guys just taped their sticks and left. They didn't do anything. But then the coaches got hold of it, and they made it. Uh, am, are you yawning? Are you, am I boring you? I, I thought wasn't she was yawning. yawning. I, think she did, I did yeah. not she yawn. Did. I d <laughs> anyway. Uh, You're yawning me with your story. So, so they they started to use it as a coaching situation, and then it developed into <laughs> uh, skate practice, shoot, you know, power play stuff, and and now it's coming around to what Mike Sullivan has said and John Tortorella has said it. I think that that, that they're overrated, and because there's so many games um, that you can use the time to get rest. We're, we're Kruger's talking about mm -hmm. it in Buffalo too, not not having as many game day skates. So. Uh, I don't think they're really necessary. I, I like to go there and, you know, it, it's a long day. Yeah. If you're waiting for, you know, especially if it's an 8 o'clock game, it seems like forever. So breaking it up, trying to think about what's going on, maybe talk to a couple guys in there. was never a burden for me to go to the, the morning skate. It was, it was kind of fun. But coaches did take it a little too seriously after a while, and I think we're, they're loosening their grip now. Yeah, I, was, I personally was never a fan of it, but... Uh... You're never a fan of practice. Either. No, I didn't like to practice either. I have to admit that. You could show too many flaws in practice. But morning skates were, in my eyes, not a necessary thing. Um, and I was, I'm happy to hear that coaches are moving away from it. I, I did like the fact of getting up, though, in the morning and having something to do because the days are long. And when you're in the midst of a long road trip, maybe you know a seven- or eight-day road trip, that's a long time to have a lot of time on your hands. So getting to the rink and doing something I think is important, not necessarily necessarily going on the ice but I do think getting in and kind of getting the day rolling and you know seeing the guys and getting ready kind of focused on the For, game that's coming and, that and from a coaching perspective it offers you um, a low-key opportunity to talk to certain people yeah. and that, that that to me was from a coaching perspective that's what I wanted to get out of it I I knew if if I had to talk to one guy about the power play or somebody else about his ice time and 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 that's a time too when you have to make lineup decisions mm -hmm. and go and talk to a player face to face oh, and say you know you're not going tonight and and that's not a fun thing to do but you got to you got to do it a lot of coaches are now sending their assistant coaches over to I do know the we're going to tell D. some stories in a second it just it reminds me of the morning skate at one of my worst moments with a head coach ever it was in Washington playing for Terry Murray and it's like 11 games into the season we played the first three games I scored in the third game and got sat out the next game and I'm like that doesn't normally when you score you at least stay in the lineup I was then played the next three games and scored in the third game again and I'm thinking all right that's great I'm you know keep going here the next game he sat me out so it happened twice the next three games did he happened. tell you why no he wasn't a great uh guy and telling you exactly what you were doing wrong he let you think about it that would be communicated right? yeah <laughs> yeah so the third three more games go by when I'm back in the lineup I score again 
And that, okay, so now the, everyone on the team sees what's happened. It's my second year in the league, too. So when I think about it in perspective, it's just a crazy thing that happened. So the night before the next game, we're in Anaheim, and we go to dinner at the White House restaurant that you ever go yeah, to yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, And we're all having this big meal. There's about 12 of us at dinner. It wasn't a very clicky team, so everybody kind of went out together. And Randy Burge was on the team, and he played for you, right? Yeah. He's a character. He's a funny guy, and he's t given it to me at the dinner table. He said, yeah, you scored again, kid. You're going to be out of the lineup. <laughs> Terry Murray's going to – he's just – and he's a real uh, emotional speaker, right? And I'm thinking – no, he's not, but I took it, and everyone at the dinner's kind of given me the, the gears. <laughs> so then in the morning skate, the next day in Anaheim, it's the first time we'd ever played against the Ducks or the Mighty Ducks at that time because the, the franchise had just started. So we're in that morning skate, and here he comes. Like, And I'm going, no, don't do it. And sure enough, he says, uh, Jonesy, get a skate in, which is not what a player wants to hear. It means you're out of the lineup. And I told him to go F himself <laughs> in front of the entire oh, team gosh. and loudly. And in the morning skate, it's pretty quiet in there. And he said, you can't say that to me. I said, I just did. <laughs> and I'll say it again if you would like. And he said, what's going on? Like he was in absolute shock. Now, unbeknownst to him, and he wouldn't even know this story to this day, I was so mad that the guys had been busting my stones all night that I snapped. <laughs> and it wasn't really about his decision, whether it was the right decision to make or not. So anyway, the whole team left the ice. The whole team leaves the ice. And Terry Murray and I have this conversation. I give him a lot of credit for having this conversation with me because I was really upset, obviously. And by the end of it, he said, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. You should be playing tonight. And I said, well, go tell the guys. He said, I can't do that. And I said, well, just go tell them and I'll, I'll play the game. He said, no, I can't do that. I said, well, I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> what? I'm not coming to the game tonight. <laughs> And he said, you have to come to the game tonight. You can't do that. I said, uh, I'm not. I'm going to Disneyland. So I went to the game, and I sat up in the, the dinner place there. They had a nice restaurant that overlooked the game. It was a brand-new arena, and I had a nice meal, and Cocktail. I admit I had a couple beers. Yeah. <laughs> and I watched, I watched the Capitals at my team beat the Ducks 5-3 in the first time that they ever played. And Randy Burge had a hat trick in that game. So anyway, Terry Murray and I met up, made up, and he thankfully accepted my apology for snapping on it. But I never really told him exactly what the genesis of was, why I was so Bruce upset. Ego. Yeah, just the fact that the guys had just been giving it to me the whole time. Then I played the next game and scored. And I didn't get set out the next game. So in the end, it actually worked out to my benefit. But. And then he came to be a on television. Peak, <laughs> I'm kidding. At the real Keith Jones. Yeah. Right didn't you like? Didn't you run practice once? You, you, well, you, that's you, another you, bad moment for me. But I want. Did you like, snap another time? Yeah, I did. I uh, when I was also in Washington. This now Terry Murray had been removed, and Jim Schoenfeld was the head coach. And then we had the lockout in. Well, no, 94 was the lockout. So the first half of the season we missed. And I, I came back in awful shape, I have to admit it. Now we're nine games into the next year, and I'm not doing anything offensively. And, and Jim Schoenfeld tells me, you're not playing tomorrow. We had a game in Boston the next day, an afternoon game. So this is a practice the day before. And I was upset that I'm not playing, but in retrospect, I really deserved to be scratched, but my response to something like that was always to snap out. So I was then skating with Olaf Kolzig was in net. He was the extra goalie at that time. They were the backup. Uh, Burridge was also on the ice. Ken Klee was on the ice. And there's one other player that I always forget. So it was the five of us, and we're doing all those drills where you're getting skated. In those days, you got you got buried if you weren't playing. The reason you wanted to play games is because you did not want to get physically <laughs> killed as an extra guy. Anyway, I missed the net on a shot on Kozik by like an inch. It was a drill where you shot the puck, skated, came back, shot another one, skated over, and I missed like this. And Keith Elaine was assistant coach, who now is the head coach at Yale. And unfortunately, Keith Elaine told me and yelled at me to hit the net. And it just didn't sit well with me. So... <laughs> I took my next shot on Kolzig, and I missed the net by 30 feet on purpose. And now Keith Elaine, and I looked at him, I said, was that close enough for you? And he's like, you're an 
a-hole he said to me and I said well you're this and that and Shoney's this and I uh, used some pretty bad language and I said I got a better idea why don't you get the off the ice and all skate the guys and of course Keith oh, Lane's an assistant coach he has it's an awful thing for me to do and when I look at it now I'm a, I would be apologetic about it but anyway <laughs> he had no choice he left which I asked him to do and it just seems terrible now when you think back on it <laughs> and I've never skated harder in my life I skated I had the guys doing red line back suicides blue line back red line back and I'm leading the way and these guys are all doing it and Randy Burridge just can't believe what has happened <laughs> so this goes on for 30 minutes I stayed on the ice a lot longer than I ever would have before and now here we come off the ice and I get into the locker room and um, Todd Button was the assistant coach uh, Todd then went to Calgary and it's Craig Button's Craig's brother brother yeah and uh, Todd's a good guy, too. And he came in the locker room and he goes, I've got half my gear on, you know, and I'm sitting there just waiting. He says, uh, Shoney would uh, like to see you. I go, oh, really? <laughs> and I walk in and Shoney sits me down and just blasts me. And he's saying, did you say that I'm this, this, and this? And I'm going, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> and did you say Keith's this? And I'm, yeah, that's correct. And then he, it, it turned into this long uh, ordeal and uh, he, he started showing me what they had rated me in the first nine games I guess you guys did this as coaches I, I rated a, a scale yeah. of five and he would say I rated you a two uh, Todd rated you a two Keith rated you a two and I would go I can't believe it these guys had the same rating as you had that's just I'm just amazed that this happened right and this theme just carried on for quite some time but uh, Shoney and I made up and it really wasn't him that I was snapping at but in retrospect it was the wrong thing to do I don't recommend it I don't know if anybody could get away with it today without no. uh, surviving. I mean, if right? you coached him, what would you have done with a player no, like he, that? He would have he been, would have... he's a total pain in the ass. He's a pain in <laughs> the ass now. And you're just getting an inside glimpse, people out there. This is the real Keith this Jones, why we, which you're That's saying. why I say, Jones. These stories will go on Jonesy forever. on TV is different than Jonesy off TV. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> keep it that way. Yeah, exactly. Well, morning skates are, you know, you never know what you're going to get with them, but... As a coach, I approached it a little, uh, one time, a little bit differently. We were on a long road trip, and we were having a tough time. I mean, a really tough time. Um, and I knew, because of the schedule, that we were playing Winnip or Vancouver next. Because of the schedule, uh, we had travel, and then we get into Vancouver. I knew they needed to rest, but I was just livid. I was just incredibly ticked off at the way that they were playing. So we get out for the skate, and uh, I said, you know what? You guys just, you, you, all of you suck. And I said, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do something because I've let you suck. I'm the one that's responsible for this mess. I can't believe how badly I've been coaching you bums. I said, look at you, Ray Bork. You know what I'm gonna do for you, Ray Bork? I'm going to do an over and back. It's give away Ray, isn't it? That's all you do is give the puck away. <laughs> and I, so I skated over and back into the sprint over and back. And then I went down to the next guy. And then, oh, Brickley, you know, you're so in such bad shape. It's pathetic. For you, I'm doing it over. So I went over and back. And I went down through all 22 guys at the roster. Oh and I, and I, I got to the end, and I just, I just slammed my stick and said, um, I'm getting the out of here and, that's, <laughs> I just, and I just skated off and that was it and they didn't know what to do with it. I, they talked to guys now that were there for that one and they remember it vividly and so do I I, I collapsed in the locker room after <laughs> I, I got say, off I it was feel like, after that. but it was uh, it, I made my point anyway yes, it was good did. use of the morning skate what and other ways with uh, to motivate the players creative ways didn't you once stick them in like the worst oh, the, the, hotel the dive hotel on route one in saugus right revere yeah that was um actually that was in the playoffs and we were we had a two game lead on montreal <laughs> and then story. and then we 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 went to montreal and they waxed us and i went from feeling very confident to like oh my god this is this is a tough situation here so Often players would be asked to go to the hotel at home games during the playoffs. 
So I said, meet at the Colonial Hotel in, in Linfield, a nice hotel, beautiful health club, golf course in the back, all that kind of stuff. And I said, then we're gonna go to, uh, we're gonna go for a skate. And I said, so everybody drove their cars to the parking lot, which I knew they would do because I had a bus waiting for them <laughs> to take them to this dumpy little rink in Saugus, right? <laughs> it's rink. A, the, the rink is just <laughs> Kasabuski. It was terrible, <laughs> now it's terrible then. And uh, we went out for the skate and it was another one of those where I didn't want to skate them hard. And when I got on the ice, this is a true story. Chris Nyland keeps telling me this is, I made this up, that I, I, I found a dead bee, you know. For, for So I picked it up and I gathered them all around. And I said, look what I, this is so fitting, what I came onto the ice, you know. You're all dead bees. That's what you are. And I threw it at oh, somebody. You didn't bring the dead bees? I know, it was I didn't. Like, They're dipping on the lying like, on the ice? Dead bees, that's what you are. And then I like half Crazy. skated around, but I was like, spittle was coming out of my mouth. I was, remember, your Jeff Lazaro was, I was in his face and foam was coming all over the place, but I didn't skate them hard. Uh, but what we did was we got back on the bus and we went to the Town Line Inn in Saugus, which is a, a welfare motel, actually, uh, and still exists. Yes, it and does. and um, so we checked in and the people there were so nice, like they had cans of Pepsi for everyone we got there. We had a meeting, we had a meeting in the lobby of the, uh, of the, the inn and it was probably like 25 by 25. And I brought in all these pictures of guys that I had played with and I, I said, now this was a player. This, this guy over here, Wayne Cashman, that guy would show up and play hard every game. Don Marcotte, you couldn't get the puck off the wall. These people cared. So look at John Wensink, he would fight anybody. Look at him, went through all this paraphernalia. Look at me, I'm getting it's worked up. Oh, yeah. it's <laughs> so, so we go through all that and they have no idea that they're about to spend the night at the town line <laughs> in. So they get the keys and they're just like flabbergasted. And I said, okay. We're meeting around the corner. I fortunately found this really nice little Italian restaurant and made arrangements to have a nice dinner. So we all sit down. Like they, they all want to kill me at this point. They have no use game. for. They have no use for me at this point whatsoever. So we sit down and you know we chat a little bit. We're talking about the game, how things are going to go, and 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 I and I'm looking around the room and I see Bork and I said, you know what? I can't make him stay here. I, said, I, need, a, I, need, a, I, need, <laughs> I need I need certain guys to be well rested. So I said I said now this is what really, Cam Neely talks to me about this now and he's still he's still angry about it. I said Ray you you can go home. I looked at Dave Poole and I said and he was sick as a dog. I said Dave go home and get some rest. And then I think it was uh, Andy Moog whoever the starting goalie was and uh, like four or five other players. I said you go home and get some rest. And the rest of them were just just couldn't believe it. And and so we uh, they all went back to the motel. I understood later that some of the guys actually went from doubles to triple because they were afraid. <laughs> <laughs> they were afraid the, yeah, in the room. And, and so I went back to my room, and I had driven there in my car, and I went home and went to sleep. <laughs> did you <laughs> yeah, did. That's That's like, amazing. How'd you play the next game? We won. There you go. We won. It worked. Did guys yeah. sleep at all? Yeah, I don't know, but Who knows? I mean, they maybe they played guilty or played with I don't, fear. Yeah. You never so know, I don't know how those things. That motel again. You never know how those things actually impact the result the next night but what we did need was like we needed a slap in the face I, I thought we needed a slap in the face because we had we'd gone from dominating the first two games to being dominated in the next two games and reality was going to set in and if we didn't we didn't get a grip on it uh, we were going to lose it we wound up winning in seven games did, did you ever have a player react poorly to you telling him he's going to be scratched uh yeah, nothing too dramatic. Um, although, I mean, I, I can tell you this other morning skate story when, you know, we beat Montreal. It might have been that same year. And Chris Nyland was on our team, had been gone to the Rangers, came to us. And I had not played him very much in the, in the seventh game. And after we won the seventh game, he went down to the Canadians' locker room to hang out and be with his old buddies because he was kind of was kind of flipping me the bird. So the next day we had we only had one day off, and then we were playing the next starting the next series because it had gone seven games. I took the opportunity 
to skate around beside him for about five laps, oh. telling exactly what I thought of him and what his behavior was, <laughs> what an asshole he was. And so, so everybody in the building could hear it. So, and there was a lot of reporters there, and there were a lot of players that still, that's still on the ice. So it was, uh, it was an interesting moment. Wow, these are your players. I wonder what your children's stories would be like if we got them on the podcast. <laughs> and that's the story for another yeah. time. Yeah. Well, if this is your swan song, it's been very fun. Thank All you right. for the story. Thanks, Catherine. It's nice work, everybody. <laughs> it's right. been nice knowing you. That's going to do it Keith for George our line starts. A reminder, a brand new episode comes your way every Wednesday. And we hope to see you next Without time. Without pay. <laughs>